Welcome home, everybody. You're watching Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. We're so glad to have you with us today here in the House of Faith. I want you to make sure you get your Bible today. We're going to get into the Word of God together. And I want you to make the decision right now at the top of this broadcast that you're not tuning in. You're not here to hear from me. You don't want to hear from me. You and I both want to hear from Him. And that's what we have the ability to do when we open up the Word of God. This Word is living, it's alive, and this is God speaking to us. As a matter of fact, don't ever say again, as long as you live, that you never hear God speak. What you do is you open up the pages of these scriptures and you let Him speak. Let Him speak to your heart, let Him speak to your mind and speak to your life. And that's what's going to happen today as we get into His Word together. I want to remind you there's a lot of good things happening right now here at Pearson's Ministries International. We are in, in preparation stage for the launch of Legacy Church. Now, we, we've been at this for months, uh, but, but God has been so good. He's been so faithful, and we're experiencing favor, and doors are being opened for us in Jesus' name that are enabling us to get into this building. The building I'm standing in right now is the future home of Legacy Church. I'm just in a small room, but we've got a 30,000 square foot facility here that God has blessed us with. And we have released faith for $100 a square foot. And we believe that will enable us to pay off this entire property, including the 151 acres that we're on. It enables us to build out the sanctuary, some other spaces in the church as well getting us ready to have church, getting us ready to open the doors on Sunday mornings and welcome in this, com this community and people from everywhere who want to come and be a part. And I mean that sincerely. We've already got people moving into this area to come be a part of what God's doing. And it's such an awesome, awesome experience to watch the Lord do this thing. And if you want to be a part of it, there are a number of ways you can get involved. Number one, we would ask for your faith. Be in agreement with us that we have everything we need to do all we're called to do. You can add your faith to ours on that. Pray with us. Give. You can give financially into this buy up and build out project if you want to do that. A number of ways you can get involved. You can, you can sow online, pearsonsministries.com or go to legacychurch.family and there you can see the progress, the most up-to-date progress that we've made in the buy up and build out project. You can give online there. If you want to text, you can do that. You can text LTV and any dollar amount to the number 28950. And of course, that's for people watching inside the United States. That seed is going to go right into the Buy Up and Build Out project. If you'd like to write a check, you can make it to Legacy Church or PMI, Pearson's Ministries International, and send it to the address that you see there on your screen. And if you want that to go into this project, just mark it somewhere there on your check, Buy Up, Build Out, and we will put that all towards this project. Father, we thank you. For the good work you've begun in us, we call you faithful to finish it. And not just the work you've begun in us here at this church and in this ministry, but the good work you've begun in everybody watching and listening to this broadcast right now. We call you faithful, Lord, to complete the work that you started in them because you are the author and the finisher of our faith. As we come before your word today, I ask you to speak to us and speak through us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got your Bible, I want you to go with me again to the book of Galatians chapter 5. We began a series here on Legacy TV a number of weeks ago that we're calling Free People. And this is tracking right in line with what we're doing here in Legacy Church right now. Uh, since the beginning of this year, this is the track the Lord has had us on. And it came somewhat of a, as a surprise to me. I thought we'd take the first part of the year, talk about vision. And everybody I've talked to that has said, you know, when you're starting a church and you're You've got these meetings, these interest meetings where people are coming, make sure you're giving vision. And we are doing that. But all I can do at the end of the day is open the word and, and go with what's in my heart. And what we're about to read here in the book of Galatians and in other places, I know beyond any shadow of any doubt that this is the direction for Legacy Church, this local family, and for Legacy TV, this global assignment that we have together. And if you're a partner with us in this ministry, you are a part of this assignment. And in Galatians chapter 5, I want to begin reading in verse 1. We've looked at this verse several times together, but let's look at it again. Paul, writing to this church, said by the unction of the Holy Spirit, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, that's the freedom, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. You know, Christ has made us free. And that's what Jesus was anointed to do while He was here on this earth. 
He said, the Spirit of the Lord's on me because He's anointed me to preach. Preach what? Preach the gospel to the poor. Why? Because poverty is a prison and the preaching of the gospel will get you out of that prison. He said, the Spirit of the Lord's on me because He's anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. Living with a broken heart is a prison because it limits your freedom in relationships moving forward because of what's been said to you, what's been done to you in the past, and living with that hurt and carrying that hurt day in and day out of your life, living with that broken heart has set up walls around you. And you know this without me even telling you. You know that what you've been through and the way it's affected you has in turn affected the people around you in your life, and it has literally set up walls around you, walls that keep you in and walls that keep them out. But Jesus was and is anointed to tear down those prison walls and set you free. Glory to God. This is His desire for you. This has always been God's plan for man, that they be free. That was the gift He gave them in the garden, and it's what they gave away to Satan. They gave away their freedom and enslaved themselves to sin and to death and to bondage. But glory to God, He went to work. God went to work right then and there on this plan called redemption. And it was a plan not just to buy you back, but to buy your freedom back. He created you to live as a free person. He created us to live as free people. Look at it again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. We talked about that on last week's broadcast, how tempting it is to go back to prison even after you've been set free. But we have to, in obedience to the word, stand in our freedom and make the determination, Jesus has set me free and I am not going back to anything that ever enslaved me before. And by His grace, you can live free. I want to move on in this today. We're here in Galatians chapter 5. You're looking at verse 1. Skip ahead to verse 13. Listen to what he said in verse 13. This whole chapter is about our freedom. If we had time, we'd read the whole thing. But for the sake of time, just look at a couple of verses with me. Verse 13, he said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Do you know that you have a calling on your life? A heavenly calling. A calling from God. And a big part of that calling is the calling to liberty. You have been called to liberty. You've been called to freedom. Living free is a big part of you living in the rest of what God's called you to do. Being free to be obedient. Being free from the fear that would try to keep you from stepping out in faith and obedience. You are called to liberty. But listen to this. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to verse 13 again. You brethren have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. What's our liberty for? We've established over the last several weeks that yes, God wants us free. He created us free. He created us to live free. But then the next question is, even looking at what Jesus has done to purchase our freedom, to secure our freedom, the next question we have to ask is, okay, well, what's our freedom for? We see here we're not supposed to use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But what is our freedom for? As born-again believers, what are we free to? Well, he said, don't use liberty as an opportunity to, uh, uh, of the, for the flesh, but through love serve one another. God has set us free, but our freedom is not so we can just do whatever we want with this flesh and in this life. He set us free so that we could turn around and serve. I know that sounds strange Strange to our thinking that if we were free, we wouldn't be serving, but not for the born-again believer. We are free, therefore we serve. 
Listen to me. The most miserable life you can live is the self-serving life. That's a miser miserable prison to live your life in. To where all you ever do is live to meet your own need. All you ever do is live to serve your own desires, your own lust, your own flesh. That's a miserable life. But the most fulfilling life is a life lived in service to God and in service to His people. That is what's free, what freedom is for. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 20. I see so much in this account that we're about to read, and I know I've only got a few minutes here to communicate it to, communicate it to you, and I, I need the Lord to help us with it. But in Matthew chapter 20, look in verse 20. It says, The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Now Jesus preached so much everywhere he went. He preached the kingdom, the kingdom of God. This is how it works in the kingdom, he said. The kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like that. The kingdom of God is at hand. And he preached the kingdom so much that these guys and the people who heard it, they had in their minds that any day now, he was going to be setting up a natural earthly kingdom. And this, just listen to what happened. This mother of two of the disciples came to Jesus. I mean, just get this picture. These disciples come to him and say, um, Jesus, this is, our, this is our mommy and she wants to ask you something. Go ahead, mommy. And she comes and she says, I want you to do something for me. And he says, what is it you wish? And she said, grant that these two may sit, one on your right and one on your left. Where? In your kingdom. Now, I don't want you to miss what it is she's asking for here. She's asking for place. Now, there's other accounts of this in, in the other gospel accounts. The others don't include the mother's presence. They have the, the two coming to Jesus, but the question's the same. They said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Even, even a kid knows that's wrong. Even when you were a kid, if you had to come to mom and dad and say, I'm going to ask you a question, but just promise me you're going to say yes. Even a kid knows that if you have to ask like that, the answer's no. But that's what they did to Jesus. We want you to do whatever we ask. He's like, what are you asking? And what they, are, what they were asking for was place, was position. And Jesus answered in verse 22 and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, Yeah, we can do that. Jesus had it right. He said, you don't even know what you're asking. You have no idea what you're asking for. He said, can you drink this cup? And they looked at each other like, yeah, I can drink. You got the cup here now. I'll drink it right now if you want me to. I'm kind of thirsty. They have no idea what's going on. He said to them, you'll indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Now I want you to notice what happened as a result of all this. Verse 24, When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. The Weiss translation says they were angrily indignant. Other accounts of this in, in the other books say that a dispute arose among them over this. this a fight literal, literally broke out. Why? Because these two were asking for place. And you know why the other ten were mad about it? Because they didn't think to do it first. Everybody's after the same thing. They want place. They want position. And they want the power that comes with it. Because they have it in their minds, Jesus is setting up a throne, and I want everybody to see me up there sitting next to him. They want that place. They want that position. They want that power. And when the ten didn't think to ask for it, they got mad at the two, and now this strife has broke out over this. And that's literally the word 
translated in other places where it said there was a dispute among them. It's the same word translated strife as in the book of James chapter 3 that says where there is envy and strife, there's confusion and every evil work. Now that word strife is an interesting word. It doesn't just mean that people are fussing. It doesn't just mean that there's arguing. It literally has with it, and it's the way it's translated in other translations, selfish ambition. Selfishness. Can you hear that? Selfish ambition. That's what strife is. It is the willingness to do whatever it takes to gain place, to gain position, and to gain power. As a matter of fact, if you look up that word, do a little bit of study on that word strife, you see that it showed up in the, around the same time in other writings in reference to politicians who were willing to say anything or do anything to gain that kind of place. It's a political word. It's a word used to describe somebody who is so desperate for political office and political place and the power that comes with it that they would do anything, anything like manipulate Jesus by having their mother come and ask for this. And what came as a result of that was strife. And this fight broke out. But Jesus, it says in verse 25, called them, called all of them, called the guys, called them all to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Now these words are interesting. He said the rulers of the Gentiles, that's an interesting word right there. You need to know what that word means. Basically, Jesus is saying everybody else but you. Because that's what a Gentile is. It's somebody that doesn't know God. It's somebody that doesn't have a covenant with God. He's saying all of those people, their rulers lord it over them. Other translations say exercise dominion over them. Now, if you go all the way back to the garden, we talk about this freedom that God gave Adam, that he gave Eve, that he gave to all mankind. And that freedom that came out of the authority that he gave them. Do you remember what he told them? He said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, have dominion over it. And he told them everything they had dominion over. And their dominion and their authority extended to everything on the earth except other people. That's where it stopped. God has given you freedom and he's given you authority, but your authority stops, your dominion stops when it comes to having dominion over other people. That's not included in your freedom. And he said, that's the way the Gentiles are. They exercise dominion over people. Their leaders, their rulers exercise dominion over them. Those who are great exercise authority over them. Look it up. It's literally talking about a tyrant, somebody who tries to control people, somebody who tries to manipulate people. But this is not what you and I have been called to. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, it shall not be so among you. This is what's supposed to make us different. If we are truly free people, you want to know what free people do? They free people. Free people, free people. And as a matter of fact, if somebody doesn't have the ability to free another person, if they exercise, try to exercise dominion over them and try to manipulate their will and try to control their decisions and their lives, it's exactly what I said, it's manipulation but it borders on witchcraft. God did not create you nor give you authority over anybody else's will, over anybody else's heart, over anybody else's motive. That's what witchcraft attempts to do. It's the attempt to control people. That's Satan. That's not God. God, even to his own hurt, has given you liberty has given you freedom. And the people who try to control, 
the people who try to manipulate, the people who exercise dominion and authority, the people who are so drunk on their place and position and power, man, if you could see into their own heart, you would see they're locked up. They're in prison to something in there because if they were a free person, they would free people. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there's not structure of authority and, and that there shouldn't be a head and, and instruction and, and direction given down from the head. We have that here at our church. We have it in our family. The Lord has put me and Sarah over this ministry. We've got people that work for us and they're a part of this and, and they receive instruction from us, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being so, so drunk on position that... I overstep a bound and I go from endeavoring to love somebody and pastor them over into trying to control their lives, to try to manipulate their decisions for my sake and my benefit. And Jesus said, don't let this be among you. This is not the way I've called you to live. He said, it will not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Do you notice that? Whoever desires to become great, and that's what these two disciples were after. They wanted greatness. They wanted the greatness of this place and position and power next to Jesus. That's why they're asking for it, trying to manipulate, manipulate him out of it. But Jesus said, not so among you. Whoever among you wants to be great, let him become the servant. Remember, that's what our freedom's for, is to serve. And Jesus, in, in another account of this, he said, who's greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? He said, you would think the one who sits at the table is greater. He said, but I am among you as one who serves. The one Jesus with the highest authority, the greatest place, the, the, the most free, what did he do? He made himself a servant. That's what he did with his freedom. And he said here, whoever desires to be great, let him become a servant. So Jesus didn't correct in them or in you this inborn desire for greatness, that's in us. He put that in us. That's the nature of God. The desire for greatness, the desire for impact, the desire to actually live with purpose, that's in you from God. What He corrected and what He changed is the way you go about it. You don't achieve greatness in the kingdom of God by being a Lord and a dictator over people, by tripping over your own place and power. You achieve greatness in the kingdom of God by serving people. That's how you do it, because that's how Jesus did it. Greatness is serving. What do we do with this freedom? We have been so gloriously redeemed, so miraculously bought back, and our freedom was purchased for us at a high cost. So the next question is, okay, what do I do with it? What do I do with this freedom? You serve with it. One of the greatest things you'll ever do with your freedom is yield it back to God. He's made you free. You know that, and I know that. I know that. But one of the greatest things you'll ever do with that freedom is turn right back around to him and say, Lord, I am yours to command. I enslave myself to you and to your will. And you do, this, you do that by recognizing the people that God's put in your life, be it pastors or leaders or different ones. What do you do with your freedom? You turn around and you say, I will serve with this freedom. Listen to me, if you're in a church, it's not enough for you to just sit up in that place and hear the word. You need to be serving there. That's love. If you really love that church and you love that pastor and you love those people, you'll find a place to serve. The most miserable life is the self-serving life. The most fulfilled life is the life spent serving God and other people. I'm out of time. Don't go anywhere. I'll be back in just a moment.
kind of freedom that I've been talking to you about this week on this broadcast and for the last several weeks is found in one place and one place only. That's in Jesus and knowing Him as the Lord of your life. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, then the truth is you are in prison. You are in jail on the inside, but Jesus wants you free. He said, the Spirit of the Lord's on me to proclaim freedom to the prisoner. Make Him the Lord of your life today. Just say it out loud. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. You are Lord. You lived for me, died for me, rose again for me. I give you my heart. I repent of my past. I am a new creation in you, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Take my life. Do something with it. In Jesus' name, amen. You prayed that, you're born again, you are free. We want to hear from you. Use that phone number that you see on your screen. You're watching outside the United States. Contact us through our website. We love you. We bless you. We'll see you next time on Legacy TV.